This talk that uh, Marcel and I are going to do is basically a clinical talk, which is something that might be refreshing at this point. It's actually how to improve patient selection, which is everything. I think everybody in the room would agree on one thing. You want good functional outcomes. In order to get those, it's all about patient selection and spine. It's one of the things that makes it difficult, also makes it fascinating. So this, we think, is a way to help patient selection process. Dr. Maya is going to talk a little bit about uh, nuclear events, nuclear testing, and then I was going to show some case examples of how we have begun to use this in our decision-making process. And it's, it's interesting. It really is. And you may want to go home and have your imaging department replicate it. He's going to tell you a little bit about how to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, we're so happy to be in Ted's family. He's the godfather. And uh, we're all following him. I just don't want to be afraid of but uh, let's, uh, let's see. Um, so when something old, bone scans have been with us forever, for decades. And uh, it's the basic bread and butter nuclear imaging where we do uh, planar bone scans. And it's a quick way to evaluate. It's very, very sensitive, but not specific. And when you look at these images, it really doesn't look a whole lot. And you see that you, can't, uh, you can have an idea where the lesions are, but uh, you're not sure about it. The uptake is basically dependent on two things. It's blood flow and the rate of new bone formation. And we'll come back to that when we uh, show examples. What happens is that um, uh, in a patient like such as this one who has breast cancer, you have several areas of metastases in the skeleton, in the spine, and uh, those show up, and then we move on. What happened in the 1990s is PET-CT came aboard, and that really was tremendously successful in merging uh, bone uh, PET-CT functional imaging with cross-sectional imaging, and that still forms the backbone of cancer imaging today, to this day. But SPEC-CT didn't want to be uh, left behind, and uh, we find uh, applications that we could use in cardiac, in oncology, and finally in musculoskeletal and spine area. What, what brings together these images is the basic ability to integrate, fuse the anatomic imaging with the spec imaging. And that gives you both functional and anatomic imaging. And not only that, but it enhances the functional imaging by way of attenuation correction and technical factors that were not available had it not been combined with CT. So here's an example of a coronal image on the left, anatomical, and then the uh, spec bone scan, and that's the combined image on the right. And, and as I said, this has been tremendously successful. And in the last decade, and, uh, we're finding more applications in spine region. So let's start with a few case demonstrations, and then uh, we'll wrap it up from there. Ted? Thank you. This first case is a 54-year-old uh, male, competitive tennis player, high achiever, complained of low back pain, stiffness, worse in the morning, no ridiculous symptoms, no claudicatory symptoms. He basically had pain when he bent backward, whatever. It wasn't an exciting kind of a thing. He had been advised to have a disc replacement at uh, his 5-1 segment. This was an MRI that had been done in July of 2012. He's got a degenerative 5-1 disc. We see this all the time. The rest of his spine is rather pristine. A period of time goes by, seven years, and there he is with a degenerative disc at 5-1. And he's now got a little bit of a bulge and a little bit of a degenerative spondy at 4-5 and a little bit of stenosis that you can see here on the CAT scan. So he didn't know what to do, and I said, well, let's, for fun, get one of these spec scans. 
And there it is. It does show there's an uptake nowhere else really but in the facet joints at 4 or 5, which is not surprising since he's got a degenerative spondy. But of note, there is nothing at the 5-1 disc space. So the question is, why would you want to do a disc replacement in this guy if his pain is coming from his facet joints? And you'd say, well, you really wouldn't, especially since you're going to be fusing below an unstable segment. Wouldn't make a lot of sense unless you then wanted to do an operation at 4 or 5. Now, there are people that would do that. I profess that that is the wrong way to behave. So we got him a facet injection, and it got rid of all of his symptoms, and then he had a rhizotomy, and at the last I talked to him, he was doing well and was happy, happy enough. He has a benign problem. As Pat says, we don't cure these people, we just treat them. And he may well be back with a degenerative spondy and worse stenosis and claudicatory symptoms, at which point the risk-benefit ratio will be appropriate to consider surgical options. It certainly isn't appropriate at this point. Next case is a 31-year-old female, 20-year history of intermittent back pain, little sciatic scoliosis, which in my career I've noticed people with midline four or five discs often don't have leg pain, obviously. They have sciatic scoliosis during these acute attacks. Anyway, she's a trial lawyer, big blonde, you know, very nice, attractive young girl, horrible back pain, exam negative. Here's her MRI from October of 18, doesn't look too bad. She's got some, clearly has narrowing at 4.5. She has some degenerative changes at 5.1. Again, I thought we could get some more information. And on the spec scan in this particular case, again, it's really clean everywhere else. But here you've got intradiscal inflammation. Nobody knows what that means. So this is a controversial subject, but Marcel and I discussed it. I sent her off for an anesthetic discogram, which was basically negative. In other words, they injected the disc with some bipivacaine, and her pain did not get better. I, I advised her not to have an operation. I would say that given her complaints in her MRI and her plain films that this woman in many hands would have a disc replacement or a fusion, you can pick your fusion. I don't know how she would do. I don't know the answer to the specificity of anesthetic discography, if anybody in the room knows it. Uh, we have a few questions at the end we can go through. That's another case. Here's one, a 48-year-old female. This happens to be my daughter. She has a long history of joint pain. She's HLA B27 positive, like her father, and she gets these arthritic changes in different places. She's had cervical disease for a while. She's a terrific kid, got a couple teenagers, and her neck hurts. This was an MRI that was done in June of 18. You can see that she's got a bit of a pose at 6, 7. She has mild, ridiculous symptoms in her right upper extremity. She had some facet blocks. So this time she came back to town and I said, let's see what's going on. And this sort of blew my mind. I then went back. I'm not her treating physician, thank God, but I don't think she is a good one. And I said, gee, I wonder what's going on. So we got a CAT scan, and this is a very impressive example of what the SPECT can do when you see an arthritic joint. Do you know if that joint is symptomatic? You do if you talk to the patient, which I eventually did. And of course, she couldn't turn her head to the left without pain. And I had one of the better uh, interventional guys do it. And, an injection, and within five minutes she could move her head, and that was five months ago. She still has the pain, but it's much better. This was an impressive example to me of without the spec scan, I don't know if I would have you know, thought that that was where most of her pain was coming from. Here's another one, a 69-year-old male. Initial surgery was a transthoracic discectomy, which I did with a colleague many years ago. He's got one of these bad spines. He's a very accomplished person. He was myelopathic. He then came, that was, he came back with myelopathy from a cervical problem. He was decompressed at 4 or 5. Terry and I operated on him. And then he, he also had claudication. So basically, we'll just go through this. this. This was his back. You can see the results of the uh, surgery years ago. He turned out fine neurologically. 
I didn't put his neck in here. But you can see he's got a bad back. I mean, where do you begin? You could do a T10 to the pelvis, whatever you could think of a lot of things. He has back pain. But he also had claudication. We did a myelogram. You can see he's got a total block of two, three. We selectively decided to decompress him because his primary complaint was claudication. He then came back with this problem, and he says, you know, I can't stand. My back hurts. Only his back. No radicular symptoms of significance. He could live with them. So we got a spec scan, and based on this, we decided it appears to be the pain generator. I hate that term, but it's what it appears to be. So I had the same anesthesiologist do an anesthetic discogram on him, and his pain was gone. You have to have these people do a pain diary for six or eight hours. And I said, do everything, you know, that makes it hurt and see what happens. And he said, it didn't hurt for five hours. I felt great. I could I'd be happy if I felt. So uh, this patient I sent to Terry, and uh, he did a nice job. You can see what he did. Not a surprise. And believe it or not, this guy, as of now, and this was some months ago, this was in January of 19, so basically over a year ago, He's very happy, he can stand, he's not perfect, his back hurts, but he doesn't care about that. He doesn't focus, he doesn't take any medicine. None of these people are opiate addicts. I'll show you the next case. This is a 30-year-old female. She's had 29 imaging studies in the past two years. Is that a clue to the pain management guys? She's had three cervical ADRs that had to be revised. Jason will know who it is. <laughs> no, no, I'm not blaming you, but you know who it is. She's had two microdiscectomies at 5-1. She eventually had an A-lift at 5-1. Then she had an ADR at 4-5. This, unfortunately, is not as rare as you would hope it would be. It's a horror story. I saw her for an opinion as to what she should do because she came in clearly a disabled human with her mother, who was clearly the enabler. And I said to her, neurologic, I said to her and her mother, you gotta go see Carl. You cannot have more surgeries until you make some type of intervention in the amount of medicine you're taking. Her MED was 90. This is her neck after the cervical disc replacement. She continued to have neck pain. This was the result of her ALIF, which was read out three years apart by two different radiologists that solidly fused. Now, we could argue that, but on, the sec on this, here you see this, but it was read out. I have the reports. I mean, it was solidly fused. So we did a spec scan to see if we could learn anything that would help us manage this case. And she has a pickup in her neck, which goes along with the disc replacements. And this was a sort of a surprise to us. She has an obvious, a lot of activity at 5.1. And in fact, on an additional CAT scan, she has no fusion. So this girl has been revised, her neck and her back. I don't think she'll do well because there's a difference between fixing an x-ray and an anatomical problem and fixing a human being. They're totally different. In this case, this girl, her MED as of uh, a week ago is 200. It went from 90 to 200 based upon two well-done revision surgeries. I don't know what the final answer is in a girl like this, but clearly you need to treat the whole person. This helps you, I think, make some decisions in cases where you're not quite sure. I don't care how good you are clinically. It's nice to know, and Armand's going to talk about disc replacements in the neck, but I have some questions. I mean, what do you do if uh, all of the pickup in the neck is in the facet joints? Do you still do a disc replacement? Or how much is too much facet disease? These are issues that we discuss at our weekly conferences. So these are, these are the indications. You can identify a pseudo. You can find a PARS defect in young kids. This is a great test. You can find out if it's there and if it'll heal because it's new. Facet from disc generated disease. You can decide between fusions and ADRs. And uh, I just think it's a test that everyone should know about. However, you can't just do this unless your imaging department is capable. It took us about six months to get it where it was right. There were some questions left uh, that I don't know the answers to. I don't know if we have, we have little time. Marcel has some of these answers. 
the incidence of false negatives with anesthetic discography. Well, we can go over a little bit. Anyway, so, yeah. thank you. So uh, there have been good studies done to uh, determine whether this valuable in the post-operative uh, spine setting, and I'll highlight just one of them, and you can see that it is really very good in depicting adjacent segment degeneration, posterior pseudoarthrosis, interbody uh, fusion uh, failure, and hardware loosening. Some of the questions that come up is, what does this mean? I, what does red mean? What does yellow mean? And is there quantifiable information? There is really no quantification, and it's set on based on normal bone activity of the patient, and it's set by the technologies and the color scale that comes out. So it's, it's not valid to determine it's red, the degree of inflammation higher than it's yellow. It's just to highlight the highest degree of uptake. And another word about color scale is, we all know that uh, among spine surgeons, especially it's uh, predominantly male uh, dominated, uh, the incidence of uh, color blindness is not so low. So that's uh, something to consider when you're looking at these color spectrum images. And uh, one other thing to consider is uh, red means different things in different cultures. In Germany, it's uh, danger. In India, is life. And in Egypt, is death. Only in China is happiness, and so we have to consider those things. <laughs>